My wife was always cold and distant. In ten years of marriage, she never said she loved me. Before I died, I discovered a love letter she had prepared for a long time, but it wasn't addressed to me. It turns out she was just indifferent to me. The first thing I did after being reborn was cancel our engagement and help her deliver the love letter. She turned red with anger and, for the first time, yelled at me. Hugh, who asked you to meddle in my affairs. Chapter 1 One hour before the elevator accident, I was cleaning the attic and found a yellowed love letter. The handwriting was familiar. The signature was familiar, but the name at the beginning was not mine. This was a love letter Celine wrote to another man. As the elevator plummeted, I was still wondering. I hadn't even had the chance to find out who the man she loved was, what he looked like, or if he was much better than me. Chapter 2 When I woke up again, the sun outside was blinding, my head was foggy, and my brother Domingo sighed beside me. You finally woke up. You scared me to death just now. Luckily, the people around you reacted quickly and brought you to the infirmary. The boy in front of me, wearing a high school uniform, left me momentarily confused. 17-year-old Domingo. The warm sensation in my hands told me that everything was not a dream. I had really been reborn. I heard the sound of running footsteps, and a figure flashed in the light and appeared before me. Are you okay? Celine looked at me indifferently, holding bread and milk in her hands. Familiar memories were instantly triggered. Yes, that day I had overslept and didn't have time for breakfast, and I fainted during the morning exercises due to low blood sugar. Celine handed me the food and watched as I ate it. That morning, Celine had a small physics test in her class but she skipped it because of me, and later got scolded by the class teacher. 17-year-old me was still lost in the fantasy that she cared about me, but with the mindset of a 32-year-old, I now knew that Celine only took care of me because she had promised her father she would. Celine's father and my dad were comrades in arms. Later, when her father died in the line of duty, Celine's mother took the compensation money and left. Seeing that Celine was left alone, my dad took her in and raised her, because she was living under someone else's roof. She always obeyed my dad and never dared to go against him. From that day on, Celine became my little follower. Everyone secretly joked about us behind our backs, saying I had a well-behaved child bride. Later, when my dad noticed my little crush, he teased Celine, saying she would be our family's daughter-in-law in the future. She didn't say a word, back then. I thought she was shy and reserved, but looking back now, I realize how foolish I was. Chapter 3 During class, I was distracted. Constantly replaying the events of my previous life, I don't want to drag Celine down with me anymore. Probably, if I don't marry her, she will be much happier, and maybe I won't die in the end. During the evening self-study session, the teacher went over time by 10 minutes, and after class, the students rushed out in a crowd. As I packed my things, I noticed Celine standing at the door, waiting for me for quite some time, her head down, looking at the book of mistakes in her hand, the light shone on her, making her appear even more distant and cold. We walked out of the school building in silence. Celine was always like this, aloof, indifferent, as if nothing interested her. Watching her walk ahead, I suddenly stopped. Celine, you should go home first. You don't need to walk with me anymore, and you don't have to wait for me in the future. Why? There's no reason. You're free now. Celine, I headed towards the back street of the school, planning to buy a few exercise books to work on my weak math skills. Behind me, someone caught up and asked coldly, Hugh. What's wrong with you this time? Is it because I was late this morning? Or did you not like the milk I bought? The supermarket only had that flavor left. The moonlight shone on her, casting a cold and desolate glow. Her eyes seemed to say, What on earth are you up to now? I tried to explain. It's really not that. The college entrance exams are coming up. And everyone's time is precious. You don't need to waste yours on me. I need to work hard too. Celine froze in place. Probably the first time she had heard me say something like that. I used to love sticking to Celine. I didn't get into Beijing University, but Celine did. However, in the end, she chose to stay in our hometown because of something my dad said. At the time, I foolishly thought she liked me, just that she didn't say it out loud. She must have regretted it. After all, that was her dream university. Chapter 4 Celine didn't follow me. I walked into the bookstore and picked out a few exercise books suitable for me, along with a book on essay writing. When I went to pay, I realized that my money was gone. Puzzled. I walked through the bookstore again but couldn't find it. I didn't know whether it had been stolen or if I had dropped it somewhere. I sighed and decided to come back tomorrow to buy them. As I turned around, I bumped into someone. Watch out, the person exclaimed, dropping the comic book in her hand as she frantically tried to protect the bowl of barbecue she was holding. Sorry, why is it you again? The familiar voice and tone made me look closely, it was Naomi, a close friend I met in college. How come I'm running into her now? It's quite a coincidence. Classmate. This morning. 
My friend and I took you to the infirmary after you fainted. Are you okay now? Huh? Oh, yes, I'm fine. Thank you. I was slow to realize. Not expecting to have this kind of encounter with her, I didn't know this in my previous life. Naomi picked up her comic book and noticed me hesitating. Then took my books and paid for them as well. I saw you wandering around the store earlier, looking for something. What's up? Did you lose your money? I quickly nodded. This girl was indeed destined to study criminal investigation in the future. She observed everything so closely. I told her I would return the money to her tomorrow. But Naomi waved it off. Just treat me to a meal tomorrow. We walked out of the back street. And the number of people on the street at night had dwindled. With only a few students passing by. Seeing some delinquent youth smoking up ahead. I turned to say I would walk her home. I went to the garage and fetched a black motorcycle. Chapter 5. When we arrived at her building. The roar of the motorcycle finally faded away. She was afraid that someone upstairs might pour water and yell at us. So she asked me to keep it quiet when I left. I smirked. Can't really keep it down. My big guy is just that powerful. That sounded a bit off. When I got home. I unexpectedly ran into Celine at the entrance of the apartment complex. Strange. Didn't I tell her to go home first? How come she's even slower than me? Celine walked up with me. And there was an inexplicable sense of tension in the silence. As the elevator doors closed. She suddenly spoke. Is that girl the reason you're working so hard? No. We just ran into each other. Quite a coincidence. Her tone was indifferent. As if she didn't really care. I didn't bother explaining further. When we got home. Celine would usually finish her homework before taking a shower. While she was in the bathroom. I sneaked into her room and found that love letter. She always hid things in the same spot. Underneath a pile of books. Easy to find. I opened the letter. But no matter how much I thought about it. I couldn't figure out who this Lee classmate was. Could it be someone from her class? With how cold she is, I doubt she could ever catch anyone's interest. Maybe I should give her a hand. Chapter 6 The next day, I showed up at school with dark circles under my eyes. After investigating all night, I found out that there were only two girls with the surname Lee in Celine's class, no boys. Math class was another blur. Even though I've been reborn, the questions I couldn't solve before are still beyond me now. It seems the gap between Celine and me is destined to remain. At noon, I was about to take Naomi out for lunch, but to my surprise, Celine was waiting for me at the door again, holding a bag with my favorite roast chicken. I told you, you don't need to wait for me anymore. Just go do your own thing. Oh, she handed the bag to me. Thanks, but you don't have to buy it for me anymore. Celine looked at me in confusion, sighing slightly. Hugh, what have I done to upset you? You've been avoiding me lately. It's not you. It's me. I've just realized a few things. As I walked towards the cafeteria, I remembered something and turned back to her. Speaking seriously, by the way, when my dad said you should be my wife, he was just joking. You don't have to take it seriously, and you don't have to listen to him so much. Celine, do your best on the college entrance exams and go to your dream university. Celine frowned, seemingly not understanding why I was saying these things. When I arrived at the cafeteria, Naomi had already found a spot and was waiting for me. What's that? Naomi glanced at the bag in my hand. Roast chicken. For you. Thanks for helping me yesterday. Hey. No need to be so formal. Naomi waved her hand dismissively. But after catching the aroma of the roast chicken, she couldn't resist and took a drumstick. Once she started, she couldn't stop. She was devouring it with gusto. Just as I was about to remind her, a cold voice interrupted. No wonder you were so eager to ditch me. Are you two dating? Naomi was so startled she nearly choked. I turned around and met Celine's indifferent gaze feeling a strange sense of guilt, as if I'd been caught cheating. Wait, no, we're not married anymore. Naomi sensed something was off between us and made an excuse to go buy some water. It's not what you think. I just met her. We're just classmates. I was telling the truth, but Celine cut me off impatiently. You don't need to explain. I won't tell uncle, so there's no need to avoid me. She said this coldly, turning away with a hint of anger. When Naomi returned, she quietly asked me who that girl was, judging by her gossipy expression. She probably thought Celine and I were a couple. I briefly explained our situation, and Naomi smiled knowingly. Oh, childhood sweethearts. Huh? She seems to care about you. Not really. Celine can't wait to get rid of me. Chapter 7. On Friday after school, Domingo wanted to try the new dish at the barbecue restaurant across from the school and dragged me along. This barbecue place has been around for a long time and has always had great business. The roast chicken Celine bought for me came from here. Domingo ordered two portions of the special roast chicken, while waiting. I overheard the staff saying they were out of stock and discussing it with the owner, Mr. Lee. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a boy in a school uniform slip into the back, the owner's son. Surname Lee. His name is Sam Lee. 
I saw his name on the list of participants for the English essay competition. He's a top student, always in the top 50 in the grade. Of course, he's participated in many competitions and is academically excellent. So he must have had some interaction with Celine. No wonder Celine often buys me roast chicken because every time she comes here, she gets to see the person she wants to see. She always seems to be in a good mood afterward. I used to think it was because of me. A wave of displeasure rose in me, which I forcibly suppressed, to confirm that Sam was the one mentioned in the love letter. I approached him as he came out and greeted him. Hello, Sam. I'm a friend of Celine's. She left something behind. Ah, did she? Sam wasn't very suspicious. He checked his bag and said, puzzled. She just explained two math problems to me and lent me her math notebook. I don't think she left anything behind. So they do know each other. I recognized the familiar orange notebook cover, it was one I had bought for Celine. I used to ask her for help with math problems, but she was never very patient. Embarrassed that I couldn't understand, I eventually stopped asking. Maybe I remembered wrong. I'll tell her later. Domingo and I left, and he excitedly handed me the roast chicken, but I had no appetite. It turns out that when you're feeling down, everything tastes bitter. Why aren't you eating? Isn't it good? Domingo nudged me. Hey, what were you talking to Sam about? Nothing much. How do you know his name is Sam? Domingo looked around and lowered his voice, because my friend said he's the adopted son of Mr. Lee. So I remembered him. Oh. Chapter 8. Now that I knew who the love letter was for, a weight was lifted from my heart. I wondered what kind of hopeful feeling Celine had when she wrote that love letter. I'm really envious of Sam. Thinking back to when I confessed to Celine in our second year of high school. What did she say? Oh. She said. Got it. Her tone was cold and distant as if she considered it a bother. That night, after finishing my mistake corrections, I planned to memorize some English vocabulary. My phone lit up with several documents from Naomi. Naomi, these are math worksheets from my mom. You should try them out. If you don't understand something, ask me. Her mother is a tutor for an advanced math class, so I was getting a bit of special tutoring as well. I thanked her and sent a funny emoji. Suddenly, the door to my room burst open. Celine walked in with a dark expression, the first time she hadn't knocked. Did you mess with something in my room? She didn't say what, but I knew. A guilty feeling welled up inside me as I took out the letter from the drawer. Sorry, I didn't mean to snoop. I had intended to help them get together, but I didn't expect to be caught so quickly. Celine took back the letter, her face unhappy, probably because her secret had been exposed. Feeling bitter, I still gathered my courage. I know who you wrote that letter to, it's that guy from the barbecue shop. Right, since you like him, you should confess soon. He's so outstanding. What if someone else snatches him away? Anyway, the college entrance exams are coming up. Afterward, you can pursue him openly. You won't have to pretend to buy roast chicken for me anymore. Who asked you to meddle in my business? She glared at me, anger simmering in her eyes. I just want you to be happy. Happy? She scoffed. It seems like you started dating and couldn't wait to get rid of me. You used to say you liked me, but you changed your tune pretty quickly. I was stunned. Not expecting her to think this way. You don't like me. You don't even like me. So why should I put all my eggs in one basket? I retorted angrily. Yeah, you'd better not put them here. I can't stand the smell. She said coldly before turning away and slamming the door. I bit my lip, seething with determination. Celine, I will never like you again in this life. Chapter 9. For the next week, I didn't say a word to Celine. My dad thought we were both just focused on preparing for the exams. So he didn't say anything. Over the weekend, I went to the library with Naomi to work on some problems. She's better than me at academics and her thinking is more flexible, so she often explains things to me. When she feels stressed, I take her for a ride on my black motorcycle. Thinking about how we would be lifelong best friends in the future gave me some hope for what's to come. Maybe it was because I doubled my efforts this time, but my grades improved by more than 10 places in the monthly exams. My dad got a call from my homeroom teacher and was grinning from ear to ear. Celine, who was making coffee, overheard and glanced at me, scoffing softly. Impressive. Dating hasn't affected your studies. Same to you. Secretly crushing on someone didn't stop you from getting first place, did it? I deliberately retorted and turned back to my room to work on my assignments, avoiding her sour expression. There was only one month left until the college entrance exams. It was the most focused and detached I'd ever been, with nothing but questions and scores in my mind. I didn't even have time to think about romance. June came with its scorching heat, arriving together with the exams. This time, I was fully prepared, and I felt confident as I began writing. Even the final math problem, which I used to give up on, I managed to answer something, though I wasn't sure if the answer was correct. Chapter 10. The final bell rang, marking the end of the exam. It also signaled the conclusion of my high school journey. Once again, as I walked out of the exam room, I saw Sam standing with Celine. She seemed anxious, 
probably because she didn't do well on some questions, and was nervously comparing answers with him. Maybe love is truly blind. As Celine seemed more patient with him than with anyone else, I walked past them and headed toward Domingo and Naomi. We had planned to go to the amusement park, karaoke, and Happy Valley to enjoy ourselves to the fullest. In the time before the scores were released, I spent my days going wild outside, and my dad didn't even bother to control me anymore. The surprising thing was, Celine called me every day, asking when I would be home. Sometimes, if it got too late, I would take Naomi home first. Whenever Celine found out, she would always have something snarky to say, like today, which happened to be my birthday, I officially turned 18, it was past midnight when I got home, slightly tipsy, with Naomi leisurely walking me back. When we reached the building, she suddenly called out to me, Hugh, how about I spend every birthday with you from now on? It was too dark to see her expression clearly, and I thought she was declaring the start of our revolutionary friendship. Of course, you're my best buddy. I gave her a few hearty pats on the back, and she coughed a few times, hiding the sadness in her eyes. You hit so hard, you almost lost a buddy. We both laughed. Just then, we ran into Celine, who had come downstairs to take out the trash. She stared at us resentfully and said with irritation, Hugh, it's past midnight, why aren't you home yet? Hey, you'd better go back, your little childhood friend is calling you. Naomi teased in a low voice, waved at me, and reminded me to drink some honey water when I got home. Chapter 11 On the way up in the elevator, Celine kept nagging. For the first time, I found her as talkative as an old lady. Are you done yet? I'm home, aren't I? She stiffened, her tone odd, am I annoying? Didn't you promise me you'd be home before 10? What if something happened to you? How would I explain it to uncle? Today was an exception, and I was with Naomi and the others. There was no danger. Even if I didn't come home, I'd have somewhere to go. Out late at night and not coming home, where do you plan to go with her? Just because you're dating doesn't mean you can act recklessly. Celine's tone grew stern, and she looked entirely on edge. I glanced at her curiously. Why are you being so harsh? She averted her gaze awkwardly and fell silent. When we got home. As I was pouring myself some water, she spoke in a quiet voice, Today's your birthday, why didn't you invite me? Oh, I forgot. The truth is, I didn't forget. I just didn't want to remember unhappy things on such a happy day. Celine lowered her eyes, looking downcast, and went to the fridge to get some honey for me. After a moment, she handed me a blue box. Happy birthday. Thanks. I finished my honey water but felt no urge to open the gift box. She hesitated for a while, as if she wanted to say something. But then she lowered her head and returned to her room. I didn't expect much from the gift she gave me. Every year in the past, she would give me character cards from anime, the kind you get for free when you scan a QR code on the street. Those cards were everywhere. I still had those cards lined up by my bedside. Reluctantly, I opened the box, and to my surprise, I was stunned. It was a handmade little boy, with a cool backpack, resembling me when I was younger. The person who made it was clearly a beginner. There were two visible holes in the weave. She actually made this by hand. This was truly a rare occurrence in this life. Chapter 12 The day the college entrance exam results were released, my dad was with us as we checked our scores. Celine, unsurprisingly, scored high as always, 698. When I saw my score, 622, tears instantly welled up in my eyes. That's great. That's really great. You've both made me so proud. My dad, his eyes red, patted my head and said he would take us out for a big dinner that night. He took a screenshot of the scores and immediately posted it on his social media to show off. By the way, Hugh, which school are you thinking of? When are you going to fill out the application? I'm planning to stay local at a 985 university. I want to stay close to dad. Domingo and Naomi are also thinking about staying in the province. Good, good. That way I won't have to worry about you being alone in an unfamiliar place. In my last life, I didn't do well and ended up choosing an engineering major. This time, I could choose to study medicine. My mother passed away when I was very young, and back then, medical care wasn't as advanced. So, I want to do my part to contribute as much as I can. Celine didn't seem surprised by her score. Sam probably scored similarly, so they could go to Beijing University together. That's great. While my dad was on the phone, Celine suddenly asked me, You want to stay here mainly because of Naomi, right? Do you really like her that much? What does that have to do with you? I was starting to get annoyed with her. It felt like she was meddling more and more lately. Celine stared at me, her gaze no longer as indifferent as before. Hugh, if you say the word, I can stay in the province with you too. There's no need. Your grades are so good. Staying here would be a waste. You should go to your dream school, Beijing University. Sam will probably get in too, so you'll have someone to accompany you. I didn't give him the love letter. Oh, my phone lit up. 
Naomi was calling me. Just as I was about to answer, Celine grabbed my wrist, visibly upset. Don't you care at all? Care about what? Care about you? Who was it that said not to put all my eggs in one basket? Afraid it would bring bad luck. Even though I repeated her exact words back to her, her face instantly paled. I shook off her hand and went to the balcony to take the call. Chapter 13 Naomi's parents both work in the province, so she decided to stay here, and we ended up choosing the same university. Great, we can keep going on motorcycle rides together. After that day, I didn't pay much attention to what Celine was up to. Whether she pursued Sam or not was no longer my concern. The summer vacation flew by, and I spent my days hanging out with Naomi. We learned to drive and got our licenses, getting so much sun that we both got tan. Celine received her acceptance letter from Beijing University, and without saying goodbye, she left for school, as if she was upset with me. The life of a medical student is incredibly busy, with so much to learn. I spent my days running between the library and the classroom, and even meeting Naomi for a meal required careful scheduling. During finals, as I stared at the two thick, brick-like textbooks, I was almost in tears. Naomi, noticing I had lost weight, often brought me food and kept me company while I studied. Why do you look so relaxed? Don't you need to study? I asked. Looking at her, it's all in my head. She shrugged. I envy everyone with a good memory, because Naomi often came to see me. Our classmates started talking, thinking she was pursuing me, and I could faintly sense that she treated me differently, but Naomi always acted as if nothing had changed, so I didn't bring it up either. After the exams, I celebrated Naomi's birthday at school, but my mind was occupied with whether I had answered the pathology questions correctly. Naomi looked at the candles and smiled. I don't really have any wishes, so why don't you make one for me? Hugh, don't be so gloomy. From now on, I'll make all my wishes for you. Will that make you smile? I forced a smile and didn't hesitate to make my wish. I hope I don't fail any classes. Please, I'm begging you. All right, the heavens have heard you. She blew out the candles, her eyes full of affection. Chapter 14 During the summer break, I saw Celine for the first time in half a year. She had chosen to study law and seemed to be busy with various debate competitions and club activities at school. In the two weeks she was home, we coexisted peacefully, like strangers, until Thursday night, when Celine went out with friends and came back very late. I was almost asleep when I heard a stumbling noise at the entrance, followed by a crash against the hallway cabinet. I got up and saw Celine sitting on the floor, looking dejected. What happened? Did you drink too much? I was about to make her some honey water when she suddenly grabbed my wrist. Hugh. I ran into Naomi today, and she said you two aren't together at all. Oh, I responded indifferently, not realizing how much it irritated her. Celine suddenly stood up and hugged me, her eyes filled with complex emotions. Why didn't you tell me? Why did you let me misunderstand for so long? Was it fun for you to toy with me? Do you know that I? She trailed off, her eyes red and on the verge of tears. I looked at her expressionlessly, but to say I wasn't affected would be a lie, but I only found it amusing. Celine, I explained to you back then but you didn't want to listen. Now, what right do you have to question me? In the silence, she seemed to recall the day in the cafeteria when she saw Hugh sitting with another girl. She had to admit, it bothered her a lot. That feeling had lingered, growing stronger over time. Celine wiped her eyes and mustered the courage to look at me. Hugh, I don't think I can let you go. Can you keep liking me? Many times in the past, I had imagined this scenario, but now that it was happening, it was too late. No, I can't. Why not? She asked anxiously gripping me tightly, is it because of that love letter, I was immature before, unable to distinguish between admiration and love, I don't like Sam, I just felt a connection with him as a fellow kindred spirit, is that so, but I never felt your love, all I ever felt from her was impatience and indifference, give me a chance, let's start over, and I promise you'll feel it, please, she pleaded, her drunken eyes fixed on me as if I were her last lifeline, I pushed her away several times, but she wouldn't let go, the more I resisted, the more desperate she became, Hugh, please, love me again, she leaned in to kiss me, and I panicked, jerking away and forcefully pushing her back, she crashed into the cabinet, the dull thud shattering the night's silence, the pain snapped her back to reality, Celine slowly let go, her eyes full of sorrow, Hugh, I, I didn't want to hear any more, I quickly retreated to my room, chapter 15, the next day, I tried to act as if nothing had happened, but Celine looked at me with guilt in her eyes, at noon, Naomi came to pick me up, we had planned to see the latest movie released today. She looked really pretty today, wearing a floral dress. When she saw my downcast expression, she got worried. What's wrong? Are you sick? Or in a bad mood? Nothing. I reached up to grab my hat, but she suddenly grabbed my wrist. There were a few scratches, clearly caused by someone else. Who did this? 
She became alert, her police instincts kicking in. I did it to myself by accident. Naomi clearly didn't believe me. Her eyes locked onto Celine, who was sitting on the couch, and she walked over to confront her. Did you do this to him? Yes, Celine, who had been watching us since we walked in, was clearly already at the end of her patience. You little. Naomi lunged at her, and I quickly grabbed her in fear. But Celine seemed to have found an outlet for her frustration and started pulling Naomi's hair. Ready for a fight, panicking, I yelled at them to let go. If my dad came home to find this mess, he'd kill us. Stop it, both of you. Can't you calm down? I pulled Naomi away, seeing that she had a few scratches on her face. What a future police officer, acting so impulsively. But Celine didn't look any better. Naomi had received training and knew exactly where to hit to cause the most pain, leaving Celine pale. Though the marks weren't immediately visible, Naomi fell silent under my glare and meekly said, The movie's about to start. Let's go. Forget the movie. You're hurt. Let's go to the pharmacy and get some medicine. I angrily dragged her out the door, completely forgetting that someone else was hurt too. Celine watched us leave, covering her face in sadness. After buying the medicine, I helped Naomi apply it, and she winced in pain. From now on, no more fighting. What you learned is to protect people, not to start fights. She bullied you and you're defending her, she pouted, clearly not satisfied, I'm not defending her, I'm defending you, if you get reported and punished, won't that affect your future as a police officer? Naomi paused, a small smile forming on her lips before she winced again, Hugh, you care about me that much? No, yes, you do. Chapter 16, after the falling out with Celine, she didn't do anything extreme anymore, but it seemed like she really did start to like me and was trying to show it, every holiday. She would come back to cook for me and give me carefully chosen gifts. On my birthday, National Day, and Christmas, she was always around at school. I watched her struggle with sleep deprivation, dark circles under her eyes, from rushing back by plane. I only felt like she was wasting her time, but she seemed to care only about whether I was happy. On my birthday in my senior year, I was moving to another campus. Naomi was interning at the police station and had been sent out on a mission, so she couldn't be there to celebrate with me. Celine was in the kitchen cooking all my favorite dishes. I stared at my chat window with Naomi, distracted. What are you looking at? Dinner's ready. Nothing. I wonder what Naomi has been up to these days. Is her job dangerous? What if she? Hugh. Celine's sharp voice snapped me out of it, and I realized I was sitting in front of her. You've been talking about her since I got back. She was clearly displeased but also helpless. Oh, sorry. Hugh, when will you ever look at me? Let's eat. This soup looks good. Celine sighed feeling like she had tried her best, but why couldn't things go back to the way they were? Late at night, as I was about to sleep, my phone lit up. Naomi, open the window. I quickly pulled back the curtains and saw Naomi standing outside, waving something glowing in her hand. I ran down, surprised to see her. Didn't you say you might not be back from your mission? Yeah, but I couldn't help it. I promised someone that I'd spend every birthday with him from now on. She handed me a glowing jar and a box with my favorite sneakers inside. The fireflies in the jar flickered in the darkness. It's for you. I found them during the mission and thought you'd like them. Thanks. I smiled at her, feeling like I had something to say. Naomi. I. She seemed to guess what I was about to say and quickly interrupted. Hugh. Happy birthday. I understood her hesitation. Given her job's unique nature, I swallowed my words and changed my response. Thank you. I'm really happy. Chapter 17. While Naomi was interning, I was pursuing my graduate studies. By the time Naomi became a team leader at the police station, I had just started my hospital internship. Seeing suffering and death every day was emotionally taxing. Then one day, several severely injured people were brought to the hospital. Naomi was among them. She had been stabbed in the abdomen. Her spleen was damaged, and she was bleeding profusely. My mentor operated on her for a long time before the red light outside the operating room finally went off. I took a moment to check on her. Her face was pale, and it looked like she might not make it. With red eyes. I silently prayed that she would pull through. Late at night, I was by her bedside, reviewing neurosurgery notes, when I suddenly saw her fingers move slightly. I looked up and met her gaze. Hugh, did you save me? No, it was my mentor. I had only helped a little. I stood up to check her condition, asking if she felt dizzy or nauseous, making notes, and only then did I feel relieved. You look so professional now. Naomi smiled, her eyes bright. Of course, I've worked hard for many years then I'll be counting on Dr. Jiang from now on. Don't say that. Just don't let me see you in the hospital again. She smiled, her hand lightly touching my fingertips. After hesitating for a moment, she didn't hold on. A nurse came to get me for rounds, and I gave her a few instructions before leaving. Then it was back to the usual busy routine. Naomi stayed in the hospital for a month, with many colleagues coming to visit her. 
Every time I did rounds, her friends would give me knowing looks, as if they all understood something, but Naomi didn't show any sign of anything. Even on the day she was discharged, she didn't say much, simply addressing me as Dr. Jiang as usual. I handed her the medicine, explained the instructions, and tried to subtly probe her. Hey, Naomi, don't you have anything to say to me? What, that I'll follow the doctor's orders? She played dumb. I smiled helplessly. Chapter 18 In the following years, Naomi frequently went on missions, traveling all over the country, and sometimes I couldn't reach her. Celine remained just as impressive, landing a job at a top law firm after graduation and becoming a star lawyer within a few years. She's wealthy now and occasionally sends me strange but expensive things, some of them I haven't even had time to open, and they're all piled up in my dad's study. The hospital is so busy that sometimes I barely have time to eat. Celine came to visit me a few times, but we hardly exchanged a few words before I was off to work again. Still, she's persistent, always finding time to contact me and occasionally sending gifts or meals to the hospital. Sometimes, when she's drunk, she calls me and repeatedly asks, Hugh, what do I have to do to make you like me? Will you tell me, please? Why are you treating me like this? You were the one who liked me first. How could you just change like that? I was wrong. I shouldn't have said those things. Will you come back? Can we go back to how we were? Hugh, I really miss you. No one's feelings can change just like that. In all the years we were together, and in the ten years we were married in my past life, she had so many opportunities to say she loved me. Since she didn't, it's best to let it go. It's time to move forward. Chapter 19 Time flew by, and I found myself turning 32 this year. In my previous life, it was in December of this year that I died in an elevator accident. I wonder if there will be any accidents this time around. The ringing of the phone interrupted my thoughts. Naomi's cheerful voice came through. Dr. Jiang, my birthday is next week. What do you plan to get me? I don't know. This mischievous girl has pretended not to understand my hints for years, making it seem like we're not a couple yet more than just friends. And now she wants me to get her a gift. Humph. She chuckled softly. The bureau is planning to promote me. I'll be sent on fewer missions in the future, and I'll be able to settle down here in the province. Oh. And then, I played dumb, just like her. Then, this year, I'll make my own birthday wish. It's a bit special. Do you think it will come true? Why don't you give it a try? I feigned indifference, but a warm feeling welled up inside me. Before we could finish the call, a nurse rushed in, saying the hospital director was calling for an emergency meeting. I quickly grabbed my notebook and headed over. The director announced that an 8-0 earthquake had struck Tongcheng, and our hospital needed to send personnel for support. No wonder I felt dizzy at noon, it wasn't just my imagination. My name was on the list. So I quickly packed my things and joined the team heading to Tongcheng. When we arrived, the place was a scene of devastation and wails of despair. My colleagues and I didn't have time to dwell on the tragedy. We immediately joined the relief efforts. Supplies were insufficient, and access roads were blocked, leaving us without many necessary medications. We all posted on social media for help, and Celine contacted me right away, saying she could donate supplies. Me, thank you. Celine, how are you thanking me? Is this the only way you'll talk to me? Me, I have to go. Celine, stay safe, and reach out if you need anything. Chapter 20 Late at night, just as I was about to switch shifts with a colleague, a sudden tremor sent everyone into a panic. Get under the table, someone shouted. I took one step forward, but the ground suddenly gave way. Chunks of earth fell from the collapsing ground. Then came the darkness, and I lost consciousness. The aftershock wasn't as strong as the initial quake, but it caused significant damage. I was trapped underneath, pinned by debris, unable to move. I don't know how much time passed, my body started to go numb, and I lost feeling in my hands. My mouth was dry, and I didn't even have the strength to call for help. The darkness reminded me of that moment of freefall in the elevator. Was this all predestined? Am I still going to die? My phone in my pocket lit up, I saw that it was Naomi calling, but I couldn't answer. How awful. Even after being reborn, I still couldn't be with the one I love. My consciousness began to fade, and my body started to lose warmth. Suddenly, I heard frantic voices from above. Hugh, where are you? Chapter 21 It felt like I had slept for an eternity. When I woke up, I found myself back in the hospital where I work. Hugh, you're awake. How are you feeling? Is there anything uncomfortable? Naomi was looking at me anxiously, tears welling up in her eyes. I shook my head. How was the rescue? Are the colleagues who were trapped with me okay? They're all fine, and the situation has stabilized. Do you know you've been asleep for half a month? She said, exasperated yet relieved, holding onto my hand like a precious treasure. Thank goodness you woke up. She lowered her head, and tears fell onto the back of my hand. Warm and intense. Did you rescue me? 
Yes, I couldn't reach you. And then our team was sent to help. Thank you. Thank me for what? You've saved me before. We're even now. Naomi called the doctor to examine me. Then bought nutritious meals and fed me spoon by spoon. Just like taking care of a child. I stayed in the hospital for a few days to recover. And Naomi kept a close eye on me the entire time. On the day I was discharged. I hadn't forgotten about Naomi's birthday. Confessing is something the guy should do first. After all. I packed up my things alone and secretly prepared some surprises with the help of friends. In the evening. I waited for Naomi to arrive at the hospital. As she approached the entrance. Rose petals suddenly began to fall from the sky. Before she could react. I got down on one knee. The ring I had prepared shining brightly in my hand. Naomi. I love you. I've loved you since high school. But I was afraid of interfering with your career. So I never dared to tell you. Now. Will you give me this chance? Naomi. Will you marry me? Her colleagues showered her with petals. And mine joined in the excitement. She froze for a moment. Her face turning bright red. With tears in her eyes. She nodded. Blushing for the first time. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a familiar figure standing on the edge of the crowd. Celine was holding a thermos, looking like she had rushed over, sweat beating on her forehead. Her face was pale as she watched the scene, her eyes filled with sadness. I will, Naomi said loudly, smiling. I slipped the ring onto her finger, it fit perfectly. Finally, I had my answer. Naomi hugged me tightly, bursting into tears of joy. Wow, I've never seen the captain cry before. You don't get it. This is love. I'm so jealous. Is it too late to go back to high school? I don't want to be single anymore. That evening, I received a message from Celine. Are you really going to marry her? Hugh, I've been with you the longest. Why is it her in the end? Won't you look at me again? I deleted the message and blocked her. Turning off my phone, I held Naomi close and drifted off to sleep peacefully. Chapter 22 On the day I married Naomi, Celine didn't attend, but she sent an incredibly expensive diamond. When Naomi saw the gift, she immediately started making sarcastic comments, thinking Celine the mindset of a thief hasn't been let go yet. Then she had the diamond set in a collar and put it on my dad's husky. A year after I got married, Celine was still single. Later, when Naomi gave birth to a daughter, Celine was still single. Even my dad advised her to find someone, pointing out how many people were pursuing her. She quietly sipped her drink, her expression dark. After dinner, Celine looked at the little girl in the cradle, pressing her lips together. Hugh. She really looks like you. Yeah. If only back then. She didn't finish her sentence. Holding back whatever she was about to say with a slight sigh. Naomi frowned. Glaring at her with suspicion. What are you trying to do? He's my husband. Legally. Don't get any ideas. Celine sneered. Only temporarily legal. Life is long. Who knows. Maybe one day you'll get divorced. She thought bitterly. Feeling a pang of jealousy. You. Naomi was ready to throw a punch again. But with the family around. She held back. On the way home, Naomi was fuming, itching to curse out even the stray dogs we passed. Later that night, while we were asleep, Naomi suddenly sat up and asked me, Hugh, where did you put our marriage certificate? Why? I want to hide it. Stop being silly. I tried to go back to sleep, but she started rummaging through drawers, contemplating hiding places. Epilogue. My name is Celine. From the first day I came to the Fu family, I knew that Hugh and I would never be equals. Even though uncle treated me well. If anything happened to Hugh, he would blame me for not looking after him properly. So, I always stayed close to Hugh, making sure he didn't get into trouble. Everyone said I was his child bride. I didn't argue, because that's exactly what I was, being dependent on others. I hated that feeling. By extension, I also hated Hugh. He was always clinging to me, wanting to do everything with me. I couldn't refuse him, but deep down, I resented it. To avoid making uncle feel like he had adopted an ingrate, I had to please Hugh making sure he didn't get upset. As we grew older, he became more and more handsome. I found myself often stealing glances at him, and when he caught me, I'd pretend to be aloof and tell him he was vain. I didn't want to fall for him. I didn't want to lose the last bit of self-respect I had, but in our second year of high school, Hugh confessed his feelings to me. I couldn't help but feel happy inside, though I forced myself to suppress it. He seemed a little disappointed by my response, but the next day, he was back to clinging to me. One day, he got sick and the medicine was too bitter. So he asked me to get him some chicken. At the barbecue shop, I met Sam. He had just dropped a freshly grilled chicken wing by accident, and his adoptive father scolded him, calling him useless. If I hadn't been there, I'm afraid that men would have hit him harder. I observed Sam's cautious demeanor and felt like we were the same. After that, I often used the excuse of buying barbecue for Hugh to visit the shop and see Sam. Every time I bought the food, I didn't rush back. I would sit in the shop, feeling like I could finally catch my breath. 
Those were the rare moments when I didn't have to care about Hugh or Uncle's emotions. Sometimes we talked about our families, and Sam would sigh, but then he'd go back to studying hard, like a resilient weed. I thought that I should like a boy like him. Only he could understand my feelings. I wrote Sam a love letter, but I never gave it to him. It always felt like my feelings for him weren't strong enough, and it wouldn't be fair to him. Lately, Hugh has been acting strange. He seems to want to get rid of me. I saw him laughing and talking with Naomi and figured out they were probably dating. So much for saying he liked me, it turned out he moved on so quickly. I was secretly pleased, thinking I could finally be rid of him. But at the same time, I was angry. Why did he have to like someone else? Then, I noticed the love letter was missing. I instinctively suspected Hugh had taken it, and I was flustered and angry when I went to confront him. To my surprise, he was calm, as if it didn't matter to him who I liked. I was really annoyed. When we were filling out college applications, I told Hugh I could stay behind with him, but he didn't care about me anymore. Furious and upset, I went off to Beijing University, far away. Once I got there, I regretted it. I wasn't by Hugh's side, but Naomi was. Hugh stopped paying attention to me, and even when he did, Naomi's name was always on his lips. I hated that. I wanted to go back to the time when he was always clinging to me, but no matter what I did, we couldn't go back. Years went by, and Hugh and Naomi still hadn't gotten together. I thought I still had a chance, but Hugh was always busy and barely acknowledged me. No matter how expensive the gifts I sent him, he no longer smiled at me like he used to. I was terrified. When Hugh was injured during a rescue mission, I finally broke down and realized I couldn't wait any longer. I made his favorite soup and rushed over to see him, but it was too late. I regret it so much. Naomi was right. I had so many years to hold on to Hugh, but I didn't. I let him down. I pushed him away with my own hands. Hugh, please be well.